Hello, dear viewers. Welcome to a new series of tutorials on machine learning. In these videos, I'll take you through some of the new and novel ideas in modern deep learning. We'll read some papers together, discuss the ideas, and implement the solution in code. My goal in this video series is to make you, the viewer, a more well-rounded machine learning engineer. I want to make sure that you're comfortable with reading technical materials, able to understand the abstract idea described in, in these materials, and finally, be practical in implementing these new ideas in code. We don't have to understand every single formula described in the paper, nor do we have to understand the inner details of every single function we call. What is important is that we are able to think about these things critically and leverage them to achieve our desired outcomes. This series assumes that you have some previous experience with Python and deep learning. For example, we won't go into the details about basic Python data structure or how bike propagation works. There are plenty of materials that cover the basics. However, we'll still go through every implementation line by line in the style of a tutorial, so you're more than welcome to pause the video and follow at your own pace. In this video, which is the first of many in this series, We'll introduce the problem and talk about the different approaches. We'll then set up our development environment and implement a naive solution as benchmark. Image compression has a wide range of applications in modern software. Whether if it's Google storing photos from millions of Android users, or Netflix serving Ultra HD content over cellular connection, they all want to ensure the images are as small as possible for storage or for streaming. One of the image compression methods you are probably familiar with is JPEG. Rather than storing the individual pixel data like a PNG file, JPEG works by transforming images into frequency space using discrete cosine transformation and keeping only the large components. Doing so significantly reduces the size of the image, but some of the subtle details in the image will be lost. Hence JPEG is considered as a lossy compression method. We'll define our problem scope to be the same as the JPEG compression. So for a given image, we want to reduce its file size with some quality trade-off. In other words, we don't have to reproduce the image perfectly, but we'll have to reproduce the image almost perfectly while reducing its file size significantly. Of course, we are not making a serious attempt at beating JPEG at image compression. For that, I'll recommend you to look at the wavelet transforms in JPEG 2000. But rather, we'll treat this as a toy problem, which we can use to improve our machine learning skills. At its core, machine learning is representation learning. So naturally, we want to think about how images can be represented in a deep learning model. Starting from a simple uncompressed image, we can think of this as a data representation of pixels where each pixel is, is represented by three unsigned integers corresponding to their RGB values. One intuitive approach then is to use a encoder-decoder-like architecture, where our goal is to find a much smaller latent representation for the image. In this setup, we we'll, would we'll implement an encoder that transforms the image from pixel space into a latent space, which compresses our image and then a decoder that will transform the latent representation back into the pixel space, which decompresses our image. But we will have to be careful as to what we mean by a compressed image, since the latent representation itself is not enough to reproduce the image, and the decoder is absolutely needed to reproduce the original image. However, our initial approach is much simpler than this auto-encoder setup. One of the first thing you learn about machine learning is this idea of overfitting. We tend to avoid overfitting in most practical applications because the model would fail to generalize to data sets outside of the training samples. But we are going to leverage this overfitting to our advantage here because in our first approach, we're going to compress each image individually. Hence, there will not be any out of sample data. So for this approach, we'll treat each pixel as a training sample the input to our network will be a 2D vector representing the position of this pixel, and the output will be the color of that pixel. In essence, we are asking the neural network to remember what the pixel will look like based on its position. We'll train this network separately for each image, 
So if we want the best reproduction results, we actually want to overfit the neural network as much as possible. Here, the compressed image is actually the dense network itself. The image is represented by the weights and the biases of neurons, which we'll use to reproduce the image at the time of decompression. In this series, we'll be using Google Colab as our development environment. My intention in this series is to have as many of you to follow along as possible. I know that many of you won't have access to a GPU, and I really want you to get started on coding as soon as possible without having to debug your specific environments. Colab is free to use and offers GPU accelerators, but if you already have your own development environment and a GPU, feel free to use that instead. Once we start a new notebook, the first thing we're going to do is to enable GPU acceleration. We can do this by going into runtime, change runtime type, and make sure we have GPU selected as a hardware accelerator. Under tools, settings, you can also change Colab from light to dark theme. Another recommendation I have is to change the editor indentation from two to four spaces. We'll use PyTorch as our machine learning framework for the series. So we will import that along with a handful of other common libraries. We have OpenCV and PIL for image processing, NumPy and Matplotlib for data manipulation and visualization, ordered DIC from collections to store the layers, and TQDM to keep track of training progress. We will use the Kodak dataset as our uncompressed images. We can download a single image using wget. wget is a Linux program, so we can call this in Colab by using the bang symbol, which we can confirm using the files sidebar. Here, we read the image into memory and convert it into grayscale. We'll be working with the grayscale image for now because it's simpler as a first pass solution. You can extend our implementation to RGB color as an exercise. We'll then grab the width and the height of the image. This image has roughly 400,000 pixels. Now to create a training data. The input to our neural network will be the X and Y positions of the pixels. The output will be a single grayscale scalar. First, we create a variable U, which has the position of the pixels in the X or the width direction near a single row. V is our pixel position in the Y or height direction near a single column. Both of these variables are normalized so that their value is between 0 and 1. We then use the mesh grid function to create the X and Y maps for our pixel positions, then stack them together into a single image with 2D channel. The channels represents the X or Y positions normalized for that pixel. We then reshape both the training input and outputs so that we flatten the image into a single dimension. If you find this bit confusing, I'll encourage you to play around with these variables and validate your understanding. The building block of our neural network is very simple. It's a linear layer with activation, but we add a skip connection similar to the ResNet. Our network is very simple too. We first embed the input into the hidden dimension. We run n numbers of these skip layers, and we output using the sigmoid function. We choose the sigmoid function here since our output is a single pixel grayscale value with a finite range. To get started, we'll construct a relative small neural network with 96 hidden units and two hidden layers. The input is the XY position of that pixel, so that's a dimensionality of 2. The output is a grayscale pixel value, so that's just a single dimension. We send this network to the GPU by calling .cuda. We quickly print the trainer bar parameters in our neural network. Since we are trying to compress the image, it is in our interest to keep the number of parameters as low as possible. We can also use this to sanity check the correctness of our network. Our input dimensionality is 2, so that our first layer is going from 2 to 96, which has 192 weight parameters, then plus 96 parameters for the bias. Our hidden layer is going from 96 to 96, 
which has 9216 parameters. And we have two of these. Our head is going from 96 to a single scalar, so that would only have 96 weight parameters with another scalar as bias. So this network looks correct to me. Usually, for a real world problem, we would not be able to store all the training data in memory. We have to implement a data loader and perform mini batch gradient descent. But since our toy problem is just a single image represented by a tensor of n by 2, we can actually store everything in memory and perform global gradient descent. We can cast these NumPy arrays into touch tensors as single position floats and send them to the GPU. We use smooth L1 as our loss function and add them with a learning rate of 0.001 as our optimizer. A network of this size will not take too long to train, roughly about 90 seconds. Since our target is quite small, we are going to add a normalization constant to scale the loss. To visualize the compressed image, we can put the pixel positions back through the neural network and calculate a prediction and reshape it back to the grayscale image. From looking at the loss function, you would have guessed that our neural network has converged. However, our compressed image looks absolutely terrible. It looks like the neural network were able to capture the high level distributions of the scene, all the low frequency signals, but we don't have any details of the image, or the high frequency signals. For example, we can't see the details in the feather at all. As a take home exercise, you guys can play around with the training parameters of this network to see if you can improve the results here. But I can tell you, no matter how deep or wide you make this neural network, or how long you train the model, it's not gonna capture the high frequency details. One of the first thing you learn in classical statistical learning is this idea of overfitting. If you over parameterize the network, you should be able to fit to the training data exactly. But this is not the case here. My question to you guys is why? Why is that we can't train a neural network to learn this image exactly? In the next video, we'll go through one explanation as to why this is happening and how we can use positional embedding to fix this problem. In particular, we'll implement the idea presented in this paper titled Theory of Features Let Networks Learn High Frequency Functions in Low Dimensional Domains. I have two homework tasks for you guys. One, can you modify this notebook so that we can train on colored images instead of grayscale? Two, by using the supplement materials linked in the description, do you think you can understand the underlying issue? We'll discuss this in the next video.